Once again, it's time for more answers, and you will find them in Jubilees. In the vacuum left by the absence of the Book of Jubilees, Pharisees and the modern church, in which Pharisees also operate, have concocted some perverse theories that even become doctrine at times in the church. If not, they are floated around in scholarship in different circles, still making their way in. We will address some of those today concerning Cain as well as next week when we are left without answers, ancient answers, which have always existed concreting this foundation. We end up even hearing some of these things, and they sound plausible, because we do not have all the information that we should. Believe me, I get it. And we have looked into many of these things over many years, This is why our foundation must be firm and solid, but see, that requires also understanding. As we prove in the beginning of this book, what was canon and what was not, who lived in Qumran and who did not. The only library which qualifies as Old Testament canon in all of history that we have found to date, and probably that we will find, is the one in Qumran. Bethabara, as they are the exiled sons of Zadok who managed the temple worship and were the biblically appointed and anointed vessels to keep Scripture according to the Bible. Specifically, we found their library and they are mischaracterized as Essenes, where scholars make themselves fools to claim with no historical support, as Pliny places them in Ein Gedi, 25 miles south, for those scholars who can actually read, that is. There's no archaeology whatsoever that supports it, not a shred. And the Essene find was found in Ein Gedi as well, uh, again, 25 miles south. Imagine that. But ignore that and still claim Essenes lived in Qumran. <laughs> you can tell that is propaganda and a lie. Oh, then there is the biggest thing. These scrolls identify who lived there in Bethabara, Qumran. And not one time does it ever say they are Essenes, but over 20 times the sons of Zadok, you know, the temple priests, exiled, even tell their story. It's right there. Then the sons of Aaron, the sons of Levi, the exiled temple priests, sons of light, teacher of righteousness, etc., etc., etc. It goes on and on over a hundred times. They tell us they are not Essenes, and yet they call themselves scholars and say, Duh, I don't know, I, I think they might be Essenes. That's stupid. That's all you can say. Who cares what these think? They are not thinking, and purposely so. They are deceiving, setting forth a controlled narrative to conceal that these were the temple priests and the temple practices, even its calendar, are all found there, especially the Old Testament canon. Nothing gets more false doctrine than the story of Cain, however. It is the best way for deceivers to undermine all of Scripture, of course. You go back to the beginning, you pull the carpet out from underneath the entire Bible. That's what they're doing, just as Peter warned. They start with creation. Oh, there was a creation before creation. Huh? Oh, man was created before man. Huh? Oh, Nephilim existed before Nephilim. What? (laughs) The firstborn son, the flood, the deity of Messiah, and Paul's words taken out of context, all there in 2 Peter chapter 3 in prophecy, which has come to pass in our age. We knew this was coming. We knew it. And it is upon us. We dismantled over the past two weeks the serpent seed doctrine, which fails every test. Now for more on Cain. Open your book of Jubilees, and let's go back in time. Jubilees 4, verse 1. And in the third week in the second Jubilee, she gave birth to Cain. That would be Eve, of course. 
And in the fourth, she gave birth to Abel. Wait a minute. That's a week apart, week of years, which is seven years. Hmm, how about that? And in the fifth, she gave birth to her daughter, Awan. Wait, there were daughters. How about that? Imagine that. Now, that's not in Genesis. But it's obvious that it is fact. Cain and Abel are not twins, first of all. Rabbis are illiterate of scripture and make up their own. Yes, that is where that comes from. Cain was not the serpent seed either, born over 60 years after the garden exile. And what's this? Cain and Abel have a sister. Well, of course they do. Gee, who might Cain have married? Hmm, I don't know. I guess it's time to play scholar and ignore that and assume that there had to be, I don't know, maybe an alternative creation, a creation before creation, man created before man. Well, doesn't that make sense? Of course it does not. So who did marry King? See, pastors answer that question inadequately because they are missing one-sixth of Torah, which has such answer very directly right there. Is this adding to Genesis? First, Torah cannot add to Torah. <laughs> Can't happen. And Jubilees vets as Torah. Second, Genesis simply offers Adam had other sons and daughters. It does not mention especially the daughters by name. Why? Well, because Moses wrote those down in the Book of Jubilees, written at the same time as Genesis. Jubilees is that record. Why would he have to repeat himself? He wouldn't. Jubilees is this book of chronologies, times, details, and divisions. This is where he put all the facts. And without it, you undermine all of Torah. That is the appropriate place for this kind of information. Jump forward, Jubilees 4, verse 7, and Adam and his wife mourned for Abel four weeks of years. Wow. That's some serious mourning. 28 years. Four sevens. And in the fourth year of the fifth week, they became joyful, and Adam knew his wife again. That's how the Bible describes spousal relations, by the way, not as fruit of a tree, not beguiled. Those are illiterate. Watch the past two weeks if you have not. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Seth. For he said, Elohim hath raised up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of Abel. Read that part. Instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. Now wait, second seed? What? What's this? See? See? I told you Cain was the serpent seed. Yep, they will say that. But look at the exact language here. Seth has become the second seed, replacing Abel. Abel was what? The second son. And he is gone. Now Seth is the second son, his replacement of sort. This is firmly saying that Cain is a human and the first son as he remains. Otherwise, Abel would be called the first son. And Seth would be the first son's replacement. He is not. He is called second as Abel was second. This is a perfect example of the kind of illiterate reading that we see all the time, and we anticipate that will come even from this video, by the so-called, well, scholars or trolls or whatever you want to call them who can't seem to read and comprehend because they don't wish to. That's not their purpose. Next verse. And in the sixth week he begot his daughter, Azora. Oh, now there's a second daughter. Wait a minute. And Seth was born seven years earlier. Hmm. Gee, I wonder who Seth 
could possibly marry two males and two females. I just can't figure it out. It's so hard. Nah, couldn't be. Couldn't be so easy. Instead, let's abandon reason and make up new theories. I think not. We'll follow the Bible and we'll follow Scripture. What about Cain? Who did he marry? A daughter of the inferior people who never exist in Scripture? Uh, uh, no. We will tackle this alternative creation or six-day man and the pre-Adamic man theories later in this video and the next one. And Cain took Awan, his sister, to be his wife. Ah! Now it makes sense. There was a girl for Cain to marry. And the girl was created from the union of Adam and Eve as offspring. But his sister... Well, how else do you think we get from one man and one woman to our population today? Ooh, no, not his sister, though. Yes, they were genetically pure and perfect as the first son and daughter. There is no law against incest at that point, nor would there need to be. By the way, those numbers work out perfectly over the 6,000 or so years since creation. And she bare him Enoch. Now, that's not the prophet Enoch, seventh from Adam. We're not seventh from Adam here. We're just in the second generation uh, after Adam, or really, I guess, the third generation to be called. This is the evil Enoch, who is credited for founding witchcraft and Freemasonry. Really. And otherwise, we know that today in the Philippines as INC. Look into it. At the close of the fourth jubilee. And in the first year of the first week of the fifth jubilee, houses were built on the earth. You mean Adam didn't have a house? Nope. He lived in a luxury cave near the top of the Mount of the East. We cover that in Solomon's Gold series. And Cain built a city. Oh, what's the origin of the concept of cities? Yeah, maybe not so great. And called its name after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, we will posit an educated guess. It will be a guess as to where this city is. We'll go to Genesis for this as well in this video. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she bare yet nine sons. So Cain, Abel, Seth, and nine more sons, likely, or at least nine total. Now, we don't know their names, but who could Cain be afraid of might kill him. Well, there must be an alternative creation because, well, there was nobody else. I mean, let's make up a new theory in this gray area to undermine the Bible instead. This is how Pharisees operate, and this is leaven. No, that mindset is fraught, not by those of you who have bought it, but by those who dreamed it up in the first place. This is where we show absolute disgust and righteous ang anger, just as Messiah did. Go read everything he called the Pharisees, and uh, we're just warming up. So, they are scoffers, not scholars in many cases. So, Cain married his sister. He leaves Adam and Eve you'll see, and builds the first city. But what about Seth? Jubilees 4, 11, and 12. And in the fifth week of the fifth jubilee, Seth took Azura, his sister, to be his wife. There you go. Two males, two females, question answered again by jubilees, because that is where this record was kept by Moses. And in the fourth year of the sixth week, she bare him Enos. 
he began to call on the name of Yahuwah on the earth. But of course, another illiterate doctrine. The patriarchs just did not know or pronounce the name of Yahuwah, right? Uh, this is pretty early. Grandson of Adam here, and yep, he pronounced Yahuwah. Y-H-W-H. There it is. And that's in Genesis as well. Blasphemy. How dare you, Enos, right? I mean, yeah, how dare you go against Pharisee doctrine that is new and not Bible? Didn't you know you were not allowed to pronounce the ineffable name? Uh, well, no, he didn't know, because that doctrine did not exist, because Pharisees weren't around yet to create the fraud in the first place. <laughs> this is why they removed the name of Yahuwah 6,800 plus times from the Bible which every scholar should be screaming about. Yet, crickets, a perfect example of how they are programmed into an illiterate paradigm. Let's look at this on a timeline, though, so it's clear. Many did not know the Bible was so clear, and you can actually believe it. You don't have to go in and manipulate and massage it. You can read it. Now, sometimes you do have to go into the Hebrew and get a deeper understanding to understand something that the translators perhaps did not know or perhaps purposely changed. That could be. That's because they censored its timeline. It's called the Book of Jubilees, and we need this restored, Torah restored. Here's the lay of the land. First Jubilee. That's zero creation to year 49. Now understand, a Jubilee is seven weeks of years. Seven, seven. Seven times seven is 49. And some look at that and say, no, a Jubilee is the 50th year. Ah, the Jubilee celebration is seven sevens. 49, and then you celebrate it the 50th year, just like as in Shavuot, the counting is seven sevens, basically, you know, seven weeks, seven sevens, and that's 49 days, but you celebrate it on the 50th. It's the same concept. Eighth year, first day, exactly, Adam and Eve fell. They completed exactly seven full years to the day in the garden, a Sabbath of years. Now, Satan came the very next day after this Sabbath of years and after the weekly Sabbath, in fact, which also happened to be on a Sunday. The week after the weekly Sabbath, or the day after the weekly, weekly Sabbath, even Satan knew not to defile the Sabbath. Understand, he did not defile the Sabbath of years, and he did not defile the weekly Sabbath. Hmm. Now, Second Jubilee, year 50 through 99. So we're 50 years in here. Got that? 50 years in. And they were exiled in year zero. Uh, okay. So now Cain is born. Uh, that's a long time for Eve to be pregnant. He's not the serpent's seed. In the third week, which is 21 years into that, so basically 70 years in, uh, the fourth week, Abel is born, seven years after Cain, he's not a twin. The fifth week, 35 years, Awan was born, first daughter. There you go. So the second jubilee was incredible. That's the first births. The third jubilee, year 100 through 149, in the first week of the first year, Cain slew Abel. Again, he waited till after Sabbath. The fifth week... 35 years, Seth was born. The third son, but is called in Jubilees, the replacement of Abel as the second son, which is just fact. I mean, if Abel is gone, there is no second son, so whoever's the third becomes the second. Pretty, pretty easy. The sixth week, 42 years into the third Jubilee, Azura is born the second daughter. The, the fourth Jubilee, 150 years in is when Cain marries Awan, 
all the way at the end of that, in fact, so actually about 199 years uh, approximately, uh, Cain married. The fifth jubilee, 150 to 199. The first week, first year, Cain built his first city. Now, it's kind of odd that he continues to choose that <laughs> that pattern, the first week, the first year, first week, first year, just as Satan did. Ah, yeah. The devil is his father, spiritually. He is following evil ways. He is evil. Cain is evil, but he chose to be evil, but he is purely human, no doubt. And there's just no doctrine that ever can touch that. The fifth week, the 40th year, Seth then married Azura. So there's your timeline. It's right there. It's been there all along. This book is over 2,000 years old. We believe it was written by Moses. It really goes all the way back. This, and really, you're talking about from the heavenly tablets uh, for this. So it, this was written at creation, folks. This is the ancient record you're looking at right now. And yet, we believe illiterate rabbis instead? No, thank you. Don't want any part of that. No, thank you. Let's pick up in Genesis. We know Cain killed Abel, and Jubilee's pretty much the same as Genesis on that. Cain was evil, but the point, he chose to be. Yes, many, many of us humans do today as well. You do not have to be a Nephilim in order to choose evil over good. It is typically, it is the way us humans think, unfortunately, and it is where mankind leads each time, that's where we led before the flood, that's where we led at Babel, that's where they were leading at Sodom, and it's where we'll lead in the end times, except for a remnant of believers who continue his ways and his practices, which the church is not practicing. Let's be firm. Genesis 4, 10 through 12. And he, that's Yahuwah, said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, as does every innocent slaughtered, and imagine how loud that sound is today as Yahuwah hears all of their cries. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto Yahuwah, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh, boo-hoo, you murderer. <laughs> I mean, come on. You, you get... you. Whatever so, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap, right? Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. Wow. See that? It is a penalty, really, truly the ultimate penalty, for Yahuwah to hide his face from us. Yet today, the earth pushes him away and is rebuilding the Tower of Babel in a sense. In fact, they're trying to spray into the stratosphere uh, different metals, aluminum, barium, etc., in order to block out the sun. Are they also trying to block out his face? Hmm, interesting thought. We won't go there. So, even Cain knew better than that. Imagine that, though he was evil. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond, a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Ah, what? Who? Who? Who, who, who's Cain talking about? Oh, they seize on this. They seize on this big time. Oh, there might be a gray area in the Bible. Let's exploit it and come up with evil doctrine. Oh, that's a great idea. See, this brings up the first question. Who is Cain talking about? We dealt with who did Cain marry. Okay, so it's a second question. Certainly Adam and Eve are not going to hunt down their only son and kill him, right? Of course not. Oh, wait, it's 
Time for new doctrine. See if Cain mentioned other people. Well, that means the Bible forgot to mention an alternative creation of an inferior species, of course. And that's how it goes, by the way. And if you look into that, the six-day man, the alternate creation theory, whatever you want to call it, it has multiple names. It is nonsense. It is not biblical. There is not a creation before creation. There is no man created before man, and we will address that firmly in the next video from Scripture and from the Hebrew. It is obvious, and you will see for yourself. The very theory is Nephilim doctrine as it sets up that there is a superior race versus an inferior race. For one thing, that is illiterate again. And think about it. Each one of these does exactly that. The serpent seed has Nephilim long before Nephilim. Well, the gap theory has Nephilim long before Nephilim and before man. Imagine that. Now, we already dealt with the gap theory in another video. It is also illiterate and is not a rendering of the Bible. Cain well knew he would live many years and that he would multiply because that is the edict, remember? But was Cain the only person at this point? I mean, this begs the next question. Not because the answer has not always been there, but let's just come out with another theory, right? Well, they'll say, who did Cain marry then? Well, we answered that. He must have married someone from this alternative creation. See, they, they just slide in this, slide in that, slide in this, and then all of a sudden it begins to make sense. It doesn't make sense. It is nonsense and illiterate. The one never mentioned is in the whole of Scripture, basically, is what they're making up. Because there is no alternative creation. There cannot be. We'll deal with that. When you read Genesis 1, it is in chronological order. Everything is in place. And it established the creation order, period. When you go to Genesis 2, it leaves the chronology because that's already set. It doesn't need to redo it. It cannot change in chapter 2. To do so undermines the whole of Scripture. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they're after. It's like building a house, and you build a nice, solid foundation. Now it's time to begin building up the first floor. But why would you want to build on the foundation you just built? Nah, let's, let's just start over, uh, go about 50 meters to the right, and well, who needs a foundation anyway? Let's just go ahead and build. Let's start building on top of the dirt. That's exactly what they do with this theory in claiming Genesis 2 changes Genesis 1. Genesis 1 has to be its foundation, and it is absolutely illiterate to forget Genesis 1 or claim that Genesis 2 is a retelling of a different story. Nonsense. Now let's go to what is exploited, and we are not going to cover all of their theory, just the foundation, and it crumbles. Jubilees will settle this. You'll see. And Yahuwah said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain. But there's nobody there. Just Adam and Eve, right? Well, actually, no, because there was a one whom Cain will marry. But what was the edict given to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. Was Cain not aware of this? Of course he was. Was Yahuwah not aware of this? Because he just said this. You would have to accept that to even go down that road. You don't abandon, first of all, logic, and second of all, obvious Bible. You have to believe that everyone in the narrative from Adam and Eve down were completely incapable of any understanding at all, and that Yahuwah forgot what he said. That is illiterate. He's talking about those to come. And there is nothing in this verse which remotely refers to an alternative creation, nor is it remote grounds to create a new illiterate theory based on speculative nothing. Continue. Vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Who? What well, those in the future to come. 
And Yahuwah set a mark upon Cain. Why a mark? Because future generations will be told what it means and whom this is. Why would he have to leave a mark? Because they weren't around yet to know and see Cain for themselves. It clearly says that a generation is coming. Cain is the murderer, and that is his mark. He can't hide. Do a bunch of people have to be around already? No, that's why he left the mark. This is not rocket science. Well, in ancient Hebrew pictograph form, by the way, the word mark is demonstrated by a cross. Hmm. Is that why Christianity is so hooked on the cross symbol? I mean, Yahushua doesn't use symbols. Doesn't ever say he used a fish symbol, nor a cross symbol. Those aren't there. That's a cult, and both exist in the occult long before. You find the cross on hieroglyphs, on reliefs, in Assyria and other places, right on the wall, dating thousands of years before Messiah died on the cross. So, it doesn't work. Never does. That's an occult action, not Bible. Those in the occult are the ones seeking symbols and magic items. Oh, I want to get a piece of the ark because it might be magic. The ark wasn't magic, folks. It was a ship. That's it. It was a ship. And it was broken down by the carpenter named Noah and used to build his house after because he wasn't dumb enough to let the only good word on all of earth sit on top of a mountain as a potential museum thousands of years later. That's nonsense. The cloak Yahuwah made for Adam and Eve is not a magic cloak. He doesn't need magic. Now let's continue. Lest any finding him should kill him. So yes, they are coming. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahuwah. Notice he did not just leave Adam and Eve. He left the land of creation, Havilah, leaving the very presence of Yahuwah, which is where? In the Garden of Eden, in the Holy of Holies, just below the Philippines. We keep getting these ignorant comments from those who haven't watched saying the Philippines doesn't look like the Garden of Eden. Why, nothing on earth above ground does. So, you know, the same ones will say, well, it, the Philippines doesn't look like the Garden of Eden, but it must be in Africa. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you even finish a sentence? Because you just proved yourself wrong. That's completely ignorant. If that is their only criteria, ignoring all the overwhelming evidence, of course, they will never find anything, and they haven't. Where did Cain go and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden? No, it means the Garden of Eden. It's not talking about Eden in the North Pole. Let's go back to the map of the Garden of Eden, where Yahuwah's Holy of Holies resides. The land where Cain lived just above the garden in Havila, modern Philippines. He leaves that land and heads east. Here is our mapping of the garden, which is below the Sulu Sea within the earth, not above ground. If you haven't watched that part of this series, go back and watch, uh, because we go into great detail. And really, if you really want to know all of the details, go to Solomon's Gold series uh, here on YouTube, or read our book, The Search for King Solomon's Treasure. Uh, everything is well laid out there. The garden, or gan in Hebrew, means enclosed garden, not just garden. It has one entrance because it is enclosed. That is on the east where the angels were placed. Notice they're not on the north, the south, or the west, only the east because there's only one entrance. And the land to the east of the garden is the Philippines still, or ancient Havila, the land of Adam and Eve and creation, which it tests as perfectly. Now, we prove that out. Go watch uh, the videos or 
read the book. Now, where did he go? Let's zoom out and take a good look at the area. Cain headed east into what was dry land before the flood as only 15% of the earth was water. Watch our Rivers from Eden videos as well as our Garden of Eden videos. We deal with that handedly. That is what Scripture says. He could have settled anywhere in the Pacific, perhaps, founding maybe even the fabled Lemuria which is a Nephilim kingdom, because the Nephilim took it over, which is no surprise, because Cain's lineage did, in fact, mate with Nephilim, well, with angels to create the, procreate the Nephilim. But we find it far more likely. He traveled even further east to higher ground. Why? Well, Cain would have known that the earth was going to be flooded. See, Adam knew this prophecy according to several accounts. We actually do cover that. We are not going to go into detail on this because this is an educated guess and no more because no one has found the road sign yet saying Cain lived here. Just hasn't happened. If you follow the 10th parallel to the east from the Philippines, specifically from the Garden of Eden area, above ground through the Pacific, you end up in South Mexico. Well, that's odd because there is an ancient city there built on top of a more ancient city. No one really knows how old it is, so we don't have any data to prove it's exactly that old and this is definitely Keynes. We don't. We are speculated, speculating in an educated manner here. Here's what we find odd, though. And we've even heard Steve Quayle and others, I believe, mentioning this, uh, if I have that right. Tenochtitlan actually has the name of Cain's son, and that's right there in South Mexico. Enoch, the magician, not the good one, and that just happens to fit Cain naming his first city after Enoch. Hmm. Can you fully prove that out? Well, maybe you can. We cannot. Not right now. But it is an interesting thought. It's practically even in line due east of Havila, where Adam and Eve lived, called the Philippines today. Interesting. It's time to restore belief in the Bible, which has been undermined by supposed scholars who are not scholars of the Bible. They are scholars of Phariseeism as they peddle Pharisee doctrines. Every one of these, the serpent seed illiteracy, Cain and Abel is twins, uh, alternate creation or six-day man theory, voila, put. And next, we will deal with that more, as well as pre-Adamic man, man before man, man before Adam. How exactly do they claim there was a beginning before the beginning? As I said, not scholars, not of the Bible. They have to because their aim is to erode the foundations of the Bible, whether they even know it or not. Not all scholars do that purposely. It's what they're trained and ingrained and programmed into as a paradigm. So you will not believe the Bible. That's what this is all about. It is an undermining of the Bible. And they lay detail after detail after detail. Oh, this Hebrew word. You can't read the Hebrew word. You need to be able to read the definition in order to understand what it says. I mean, we proved that with the serpent seed doctrine. They're taking a word that doesn't even have the definition of sex. It just doesn't to say sex. And then you go back and you look at it in the passage and it is the biggest bunch of nonsense you've ever heard. See, you are too dangerous to their cause otherwise. That's why they censor this channel and play with things in every kind of way you can imagine. And we've seen things even in very recent days, even. This is just too important, as this is the very foundation of the Bible. And we must be able to believe it above all things. We hope you have learned something from these answers in Jubilees yet again. This book is so full of knowledge we have lost. 
that brings all into perspective and proves Genesis and Torah match and are accurate. They cannot be undermined. We are restoring that foundation. Yah bless to everyone. The Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, named by the temple priests in Qumran as the source of the exact determination of how to keep Torah's calendar in the Damascus document. Yes, they called it Torah and used it as such. This book renders the very first map of the world, the most ancient geography in all of history. Jubilee is also known as the Book of Division, as Noah partitions the entire earth to his three sons, finds the Garden of Eden in the Philippines, pinpoints the seat of Gog of Magog's power, demonstrates continental divides originate with Noah and much more. It is the second witness to Genesis and Torah and concurs. It tests as Torah and we encourage you to review this full test for yourself in the beginning of this book. It was the priests who were exiled from the temple who lived in Qumran, known in Bible times as Bethabara, where Messiah was baptized and John the Baptist of temple priestly caste lived and operated. As these were his fellow Levite priests exiled from the temple, who continued to keep scripture there, as well as operate a function, compound, modeled in part after the temple. This is the only historic library of precedence for the Old Testament canon in ancient history, yet explained away in willing ignorance, just as 2 Peter 3 warned. Based on the R.H. Charles translation from the Ethiopic, this book will enlighten and its revelation will rock your world. As all 50 chapters appear in this book with curated and edited margin notes, in large print Bible format, easy to read. This 288-page quality paperback has a high-resolution section of maps that represent the world's oldest map by Noah. Read it and test it for yourself, and you will likely find, as we have, this book is inspired, even canon, in history. Available free worldwide in ebook or purchase a print copy today on Shopee Philippines or Amazon internationally. Just go to bookofjubilees.org and the links are there for your area. We also offer bundle pricing with our other books in the Philippines. Our books are already expanding now, being read in 52 countries and more than half of the provinces in the Philippines. Join thousands who are finding this useful in their lives.